All right, last couple of weeks we spent talking about the characters in this uh, story and who they were biblically and who they were typologically. And it helps us to understand who's doing the talking and who's talking to who and talking about what, to whom. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. I don't know if, if y'all's Bibles have, like it'll say the beloved and then it'll say something. And then it'll say the shepherd and then it'll say something. Well, some Bibles don't have that. And some Bibles have them in the wrong places. So it depends on the version of the Bible that you have is what it's going to say. I'm using the New King James Version, and I feel pretty good about it, that it's in the right places. And there's some Bibles that don't even have it. So you're kind of guessing who's doing the talking. But it's very important that we know who's talking, and talking to whom. Okay. We're going to start chapter 1 today after getting a description of the characters and finding out it six parts acts. When we start chapter 1, the Shulamite has met the shepherd, but she is in the chambers of the king. The shepherd is calling her away for her, from her duties to the king. Everything is written in a sexual manner uh, because that's the way God looks at his church. You will either follow God or be following the world and its king. There is no neutral ground. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make that point that right. she was in the king's chambers. And we, we, I think I showed that the king was Solomon. So he was already getting personal with her. You're Actually, you're born into the king's chamber. Mm -hmm. You're born into this world. God has to lead you out of this world. So no matter what age she is, she is in the king's chambers. And she is very intimate with the king. Psalms one, uh, 1 verse 1. The song of songs which is Solomon's. Now I just like to make this clear that this is the song of songs because we're talking about God. Your Bible probably has song of Solomon because he penned it. But the Holy Spirit wrote it. And it's the song of songs and it's talking about Jesus because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and whatever else that we have, the Holy of Holies, everything that is repeated like that is talking about the high, the highest. So it's, it's not Solomon's song. Now he wrote a hundred, a thousand and five songs and one of them made the Bible. So there's a reason that one of them made the Bible is because it's about Jesus. Okay, The rest of them, I don't know what it said, they were all lost or whatever. But we know that the Bible says that he wrote 1,005 songs and 3,000 and some odd proverbs. Well, the, a lot of proverbs didn't make it either. So the proverbs that we have in our Bible are the ones that the Holy Spirit wanted us to see and learn. Now, God may have given him all of the proverbs. We don't know. But some of them might have been his wisdom and not God's. But we only have a certain amount of the proverbs and we have one song. And this is it. So this is talking about Jesus, because it's the song of songs. Okay, verse 2, the Shulamite. Now right here we see the Shulamite is talking, because it starts out saying the Shulamite. I should have underlined that. Uh, so there, I tried to underline them later in the, in the thing, but apparently I missed this one. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. And immediately when I read this, started studying this, the kisses of his mouth is scripture. And I started weeping. Right there. Couldn't make it any further. You know, this is a love letter to his church. This is not to lost people. This is to his people so they can find out his character and all about him. That was another thing I wanted to say. Was you find out about the beginnings of things in Genesis. You find out about the legal things in Leviticus, what he wants us to do. Each book has a reason for being written. This is about his heart. He is telling his bride, I love you and I will do anything to get you. So it's really a, an emotional book, if you want to read it that way, about his bride, which we are supposed to be. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Okay, I just, I just love all of this stuff. 
because the fragrance of your good ointment's your name. So his name is an ointment. And he is saying, or she is saying, that I love the way your name heals. I love your, the way your name makes me feel. I love everything. It's an ointment to my soul. It's, it's a healing name. Therefore, the virgins love you. First of all, I wanted you to get, get used to understanding that Solomon wrote this physically, but the Holy Spirit dictated it to him. Therefore, it is called the Song of Songs, just like King of Kings and Lord of Lords and Holy of Holies is used in Scripture to talk about God. Solomon penned 1,005 songs and 3,000 proverbs. 1 Kings 4.32, if you want to find that. It'll, it'll name it right there. That's why verse 1 says the Song of Songs, which Solomon wrote. Verse 2 speaks of, of the woman meeting Jesus and hearing His words for the first time. So she is living in the king's quarters in the world, and she has met Jesus now, and He is calling her out of this sinful world. She, in fact, later on, you're going to find out that she is in Lebanon when all this is going on. And if you remember back when we talked about the introduction, uh, Solomon built his house, he built the temple, he built a house of cedars in Lebanon, and he built a house for the Pharaoh's daughter, which he married. Okay, so that's like four houses going on in the first 8, 9, 10, 11 years of his, his reign as king. Well, when this is happening, we'll find out later, it's going to say, come out of Lebanon. So she is up there with the king of Tyre, Solomon's best buddy. So she is in the middle of it, right there in the middle of the world. She describes it as kissing with the kisses of his mouth. How sweet are the words from Jesus forgiving our sins and wanting us for his own, no matter what we've done. Whenever you get that into your head, that no matter what you've done, he kisses you with the kisses of His mouth. Mm -hmm. He loves you so much. And that's just a beautiful picture. Um, Leviticus 21, 13. And He shall take a wife in her virginity. Now this is talking about the high priest. So this is the rules for a high priest taking a wife. He shall take a wife in her virginity. She must be a virgin or he can't marry her. Now virginity in biblical sense means that she doesn't follow other gods. Okay, so she has to stop following the world gods and start following the only true God. Okay, and then she's a virgin. We get adopted in. You must be adopted into the family of God. And Israel is the family of God. So we must become spiritual Israelites. A lot of people get mixed up on that and say, well, Israel's cut out and all this kind of... No, you have to believe in Jesus and you are adopted in. And we go back to Joseph... Uh, being his two sons were adopted by Jacob. And how were they adopted? Uh, Manasseh was the firstborn and Ephraim was the secondborn. So when they lined up the kids, the right hand is the strong arm. So he put his hand on Manasseh's head and the other one on Ephraim. And then he went like this. Which is the cross. So Ephraim became the firstborn uh, inheritance in Manasseh the secondborn because he chose to take it out of order and he, he produced a cross is the way that's done. So the way that we are adopted into Jacob's family and Jacob was renamed Israel, we have to go through the cross. That's mm -hmm. the only way. Okay, mm -hmm. So that's how you become spiritual Israel. A widow or a divorced woman is a defiled woman or a harlot. These he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as his wife. Okay, in the Bible, women are churches or denominations or religions or something like that. You're going to find the divorced woman or the widow woman always refers to Israel. Because Jehovah, God married Israel on Mount Sinai when he presented them with the Ten Commandments and the Israelites replied, all this we will do. In other words, they're saying, I do. Right. Mm -hmm. So they were spiritually married to Jehovah. And you get, in, uh, get into all this Solomon stuff, you'll see all of the uh, worshiping Baal and Chemosh and all of these other gods. They even built altars on top of the temple 
Solomon's temple where they would sacrifice his babies to Baal. So that's how evil Israel became. And you read about it in Hosea and other places like that where he took a prostitute and told Hosea, you marry this woman and you stay with her a couple of years. And of course, she went back to prostitution. And I, I don't remember the kids' names, but it was kind of funny. If you think about it that way, it's like, uh, I'll never love you or something was the name of the kids. you know, And all this stuff. So you get to see symbolically that she was going to go back to her harlotry and then he told Hosea, go back and find her and buy her. So he went to find her, found her in a slave market, bought her for half of what a slave cost. 15 shekels. 30 shekels would get you a slave. She was bought for 15 shekels and a half of uh, omer of barley, which is donkey food. Basically, barley is animal food. Mm -hmm. So she got half of the worth of even a slave. And he brought her back to it. Then he told Hosea, now you go out there and preach that, that this is what I think of Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he laid it on him hard, you know. So Hosea, being a pious man, he, he didn't like any of this stuff. But he had to go through with what God told him to do to make a demonstration of what God thought of Israel at that time. Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, um, Jesus is our high priest forever, so we can only be His bride if we are virgins. We must be adopted into the family of God, which is Israel, to even be considered a wife uh, as wife material. There are many in the church that feel Jews have been cut out, and the church has taken their place. That, that is not true. We must join spiritual Israel to marry Jesus. This is why it's so important to understand that Jesus was born a Jew and He lived as a Jew and died as a Jew and is in heaven today as the Lion of Judah. Many Christians seem to feel that we are marrying a Gentile European with blue eyes that has changed his ways when Israel rejected him. God never changes. Mm -hmm. he, is, he is still married to Israel even though He doesn't like some of the things they do. But it, I can tell you if you go to Ezekiel 16... Go down to the last few verses. Now you can read the first part and it's kind of funny. But America does the same thing. So if, that'll be good homework if, if you go read Ezekiel 16. And about the last five or six verses, he says, but after he gets over his anger, yeah. he sends a sacrifice to clean him up. Yeah. Okay? And we can read about that in Zechariah. At the end of Zechariah, he talks about how he showed himself to Israel and they repented. Yeah. Okay? So... There will come a day when Israel proper, not just spiritual Israel, but Israel proper will repent. Okay? Now, if you die without Jesus, you're not going to make it. But to be spiritual Israel, you have to have Jesus. You have to come through the cross. Okay? Okay, Jehovah God told the Hebrew people how to live, what holidays to observe, what foods to eat, what clothes to wear, what laws to observe, how to build the temple and the tabernacle, etc. Because that's what heaven looks like. As future brides, we are supposed to be learning how to be a Jewish bride to the high priest while waiting for him to get us. This is what a lot of people don't understand. They, they think, well, why do I have to do all this Jewish stuff? Well, because he's a Jew. Mm -hmm. And heaven is, got, heaven is going to have an Ark of the Covenant. It's going to have a temple. It's going to have everything. They're probably going to wear even the same garb. You know? I don't know. But he is a Jew. Mm -hmm. And he told them the measurements of the temple of heaven. Mm -hmm. That's why they built the temple the way they did. All of the, the measurements and everything, the exact room sizes and all this kind of stuff had to come from heaven. So that was all given to Moses. And that's the way they started living. And they ate the same foods all these years. They followed all the same laws. Jesus followed every law. He followed every holiday. Everything that we learn about in the Torah, He followed. Verse 3 tells us the power just in the name of Jesus to heal us of our sicknesses and forgive sins. Virgins all through the Bible are true to one man. A virgin of the same country is the only woman that can marry the high priest. The Shulamite is in the king's chamber 
a highly intimate place to be with the king, offering her everything in the world has to offer. So you got to remember that Solomon was rich. He was the richest man in the world. And he offered his brides everything that they could possibly want. So she is having to reject the world to go with Jesus. And that's sometimes hard to do. A lot of people don't want to think about losing their job. They don't want to think about moving. They don't want to think about anything like that. So we need to understand the pressure that she was under to stay as the king's concubine or wife or whatever she was. We are, we are born in the king's chambers. There we are taught the ways of the world and are taught to be selfish and get everything we can get for ourselves. I hope we can all remember the first time we heard the good news that we didn't have to live that way. It was usually a time when, when trouble and strife was overtaking us and we had no way out of the king's chambers. I don't know who would come to the Lord if everything's good. The Holy Spirit has told you, even if you're rich and everything else, He's told you that your life is pitiful, you're lonely. You know, why do so many millionaires kill themselves? They're not happy with whatever. But sometime in your life, when you were broken, God showed up and told you the good news. Mm -hmm. Just imagine being in the, in the beck of, and call of the world and hearing there might be a better way. Many of us were suffering under drugs and alcohol or porn or chasing money, lost our families, or just suicidal, thinking nothing will ever change. How sweet was it to hear that someone loves you no matter what? That's where the Shulamite was when the shepherd found her. Notice here she says his name is Ointment. Therefore the virgins love you. She didn't say she loved him. She was just understanding why people would love him because of the words that he was saying. The next verse says, she says, draw me away. But then she says, we will run after you. Not I will run after you. So she's thinking about this in her mind. She's got it going in her mind that this sounds good and I'd love to follow him. And she says, draw me away, just like you're drawing the others away. She sounds insecure or maybe double-minded. And there's a lot of people who want one foot in the world and one foot in the church. See? And she says, this might be fun to follow this guy around and see what he's got to offer, but I always want to keep my foot in the other door because I might want to go back to the world. Do Christians ever say, I will do what everybody else will do, but doesn't want to go any farther? There's people that put limits on how far they want to be a Christian. They won't go all the way. They'll always hold something back. And I call it dragging that old man around with them, you know, that they should have left in the baptismal. If you notice, she has done almost all the talking and seems double-minded. When we take on Christ's name, we must come, become more like Him and follow Him alone. In Isaiah 4.1, we learn about taking His name. So when you call yourself a Christian, you've taken His name. You've agreed to marry Him. Mm -hmm. That's why the woman usually takes the name of the husband. Okay? It's a traditional thing. So if you say, I'm a Christian or a Christian or whatever, you're saying, I'm married to Christ. Uh, I am betrothed to Jesus. Okay? Isaiah 4.1 And in that day, and that day always means the last days, mm -hmm. seven women, we know there are seven women in the churches in Revelation, <clears throat> shall take hold of one man, we know that's Jesus, saying, we will eat our own food and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. So they want to make up their own doctrine. This is the bread. This is our food that we're supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. And we will wear our own apparel. The only apparel that's allowed in heaven is His righteousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have to understand that people that say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I've got this doctrine or that doctrine or I don't believe this, that, and the other. You have to be very careful. Most of us call them cults because they'll they'll say something that sounds good, but it's not quite there. And this is why the elect has to know their Bible to be able to keep them getting fooled. If we take His name, we must eat His bread and wear the garment that He gives us to wear, or we will be making up our own dogma and calling evil good, and should be called we should be called witches and sorcerers and can't hide our reproach. 
There are many that call themselves Christians today, but won't do anything their husband says to do. Now here's the list of the husband's to-do list. But they won't do any of it. And you'll see people, I'm a Christian, but I believe in gay marriage. Or I'm a Christian and I've had three abortions. They want, they want to somehow make their, their idea more important than God's idea. Ecclesiastes 7.1 A good name is better than a precious ointment and the day of death than the day of birth. Isn't it funny that Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon and he said that. Yeah, you know, but... A good name is better than a pressure, pre, precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. So he knows when you're born, you're going to be born into sin. You're going to go through all this. Your day of your death, if you ever go to a graveyard, no one is sinning. Not one person out there is sinning because they're dead. Okay? So, it's a precious ointment to have a good name. Isaiah 9 6. This, I like this. For unto us a child is born. Now, who, what child were they predicting? Jesus. Mm -hmm. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So he is saying his name will be a counselor. Who's our counselor? The Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mighty God. Hell should I. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the Father. Mm -hmm. Jehovah. Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. We know that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Notice here the child was called Mighty God and Everlasting Father. The Father and Son are one. Jesus is God, and Jesus is the Father. We have one God, not three. The Holy Spirit is the Counselor, so all three forms of God are represented in Jesus, the man God. So, He, he takes care of the whole thing. Son, uh, Song of Solomon uh, 1, 4. Draw me away. Now we've got to remember that the last person to speak in verse 3 was the Shulamite. Draw me away, the daughters of Jerusalem are now speaking. We will run after you. The Shulamite said, The king has brought me into his chambers. The daughter of Jerusalem said, We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. The Shulamite said, Rightly do they love you. So there's like four people talking round robin here. Also you've got to remember that the chapters and verses were put in like in the 1200s. So, when the Jews put this in their Bible, there was no punctuation, there was no chapters and verses or anything like that. So, all of this was just kind of made up and said, we're going to take this and call it a verse. Now you see how important it is to see who is speaking in verse 4. Draw me away is spoken by the Shulamite because she was the last one to speak in verse 3. She is telling him to keep talking and, let, and tell me what I need to hear. So she is saying, draw me away. Keep talking. Keep talking. I'm listening. It sounds good to me. Just don't quit. Then the daughters of Jerusalem speak and declare that they will run after him also. So they like the words too. Then the Shulamite says, the king has brought me in to his chambers. She is confessing that she has been intimate with Solomon's world and needs forgiveness. She knows what she's doing, but that's the only thing she knows how to do. Is get all you can get when you can get it. If the king wants me, then he can have me. That's sell out to the world. Okay. Then the daughters tell the shepherd that they love him, and the Shulamite replies that the daughters love you, and she envies them. In other words, she is watching and listening to Jesus interact with these other women. Verse 5. I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Now being dark in the Bible is always bad. Darkness, blackness, whatever. Light and white is always good. So she is saying, I am dark but lovely. Now he thinks that she's lovely. So the only loveliness that she has comes from him. But she is dark. And then it mentioned, I thought this was, this just came to me today. I probably should have changed my notes again. Like the curtains of Solomon. When you put a veil on, you're betrothed. So the curtains of Solomon, she was behind the veil of Solomon. So she was betrothed to him. She is saying, 
I am dark. I'm full of sin. But you like me because I'm lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar. We'll learn about this in just a minute. Like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark. She is saying, I, I've done so many bad things that I don't even want to talk about it. I don't want to tell you what I did. You know, and, and you can just imagine what I've done in the king's chambers. Okay? Because the sun has tanned me. The sun god is who they worship. Okay? So she was outside getting a suntan from their god, which was she knew was against the shepherd's beliefs. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I had not kept. Now she's blaming other people for the reason the way she turned out. Okay? Now vineyards are your fruitfulness, the place where you, you get your fruit. Well, she was working in somebody else's vineyard, making them rich. Okay? But my own vineyard I have not kept. I haven't done anything to fix my life or have any inheritance in my life. Everything has been dedicated to Solomon, the world. Okay? There's a lot packed into this verse. By saying she is dark, she is admitting she has not done the things she should have done. But she is talking to the daughters of Jerusalem. She is saying she hasn't done any more than they have done. But remember, Sodom and Samaria are the daughters of Jerusalem. So when you find out that Sodom and Samaria were the daughters of Jerusalem, she's like saying, well, they did the same thing I've done, or even worse. You know, not my fault. The tents of Kedar speak of Kurdish shepherds that live in the mountains and come down in the spring and summer to feed their flocks. Kedar was from the line of Ishmael. You go to Genesis 25, verse 13 to find that out. When it gives the genealogy of Ishmael, Kedar is there. So that's the other brother that was thrown out of the Abrahamic family. Okay, So we're going to find out a little more about them in just a minute. Her loveliness refers to the beauty God had put on her. The only beauty we have is what God gives us. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 16, 14. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty. Now he's talking about Jerusalem here, which is symbolic of the Shulamite. For it was perfect through my splendor. God is saying that I gave you everything. Your splendor came from me. I made you beautiful, which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. Verse 15. But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. So she took all the credit for being rich and beautiful and everything and made other people go the same way. The sun god has tanned her. Israel had problems with worshiping the sun god, especially in the temple during the time of Solomon. Now we're going to learn about the uh, people in Kedar right here. Psalm 120, verse 2. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, O what shall be done to you, you false tongue? Sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of, from the broom tree. Woe is me that I dwell in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. So they're liars and they want to fight all the time. And if you'll remember, Ishmael, when he was born, they said that he was going to be a wild ass. He was going to be a donkey that kicked and fought everywhere he went. And that was his line in the Bible. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. They want to fight all the time. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So she is not fitting in with the tents of Kedar at all. Okay? Here we see people of Kedar having lying lips and a false tongue. They love war and hate peace. But this person is for peace. People that are a form of Kedar can repent and come to the Lord to bring peace to their souls. That's in Isaiah 65-7. through 7. If you read that, it will talk about the people of Kedar coming to repent. Uh, she speaks of vineyards. Now let's look at Isaiah 5 and see a vineyard spoken of with my beloved and my love. So if you now Isaiah is a totally different book. It's written after Solomon Solomon's uh, song, and it it talks about it uses the same language. 
These are two different people, no telling how many years apart, and it's using the same language. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. So I just think that's that's showing you that the same person wrote Isaiah mm -hmm. as wrote Song of Song. Mm -hmm. He dug it up and cleared out his stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And I looked in several different Bibles, and wild grapes are called bitter grapes, rotten grapes, everything you can imagine. One of them, I think it was uh, the Septuagint, uses the words, brought forth thorns, which are curses. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. So he's saying, you people in Judah... You're the, you're the vineyard that I planted. I took out all the stones. I gave you everything you wanted. And now you judge. I wanted you to judge between me and my vineyard. So he is saying, look what you're doing. Check the book. See what you're doing. You know? What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they not rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So he's telling you, this is the house of Israel, and I'm going to do all this to it. And then the men of Judah are his pleasant fruit. Uh, his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So, whatever they're producing in Israel now is not what God wanted from his vineyard. This would be bride was given the vineyard of Israel to keep, but worshiped the sun gods and the hosts of heaven instead. She gave them, er God gave them everything, yet they sinned the most horrible sins you can imagine. Verse 7, to her beloved. So this is the Shulamite speaking to her beloved. Tell me, O, o you whom I love. She's saying now I love him. Okay. Where you feed your flock. Where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? Now we can see why I chose to believe the king and the shepherd are two different people. She is in the king's chamber, but asks where the shepherd feeds his flock. She doesn't know where to get any information about the shepherd. Okay? She knows what the king does and where he eats, but doesn't know anything about her beloved. She loves the shepherd, but doesn't know where he feeds the flock. She is just learning about him. She's not interested in working the harvest or just wants lunch with her new, her new love. She is basically saying, if you don't pick me, why should I be one more of the flock of your companions? So she is saying, I'm not going to put a veil on myself, which means I'm betrothed. Why should I be betrothed to the shepherd if you don't tell me anything, you don't do anything? Why should I go down and be with your companions and I don't even have a veil to put on? So she's kind of pressuring him to give me what I want. You know? Does this resemble your church? Are you only interested when lunch comes? I don't want to do any work. Just feed me and let me sleep. Because you'll go to sleep here in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Verse 8. The Beloved. Now this is Jesus talking. If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats besides the shepherd's tents. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. Then the beloved tells her to follow the footsteps of the flock. He already has down the ancient paths and feed by the shepherd's tents. So God has an ancient path for you to follow. And he says, why don't you just follow the flock, that's the sheep, and go see where they go. They go to church. Mm -hmm. They go to Sunday school. They learn all about me if you'll just follow them. Okay? Now, I want to all, 
I'll tell you in just a minute, but I wanted you to notice the shepherd's tents. Now before we had the tents of Kedar and the shepherd's tents. They're different tents. Today's shepherds are the pastors of the local churches. He is telling her to feed your kids, which are goats. They're not sheep. So she has pagan people that listen to her and follow her. So she is, she is being told here by Jesus to take your kids down where they feed the sheep. Okay? Today's shepherds are the pastors of the local churches. He is telling her to feed your kids the same place the others are feeding. It's time for her to start taking care of her own flocks and garden and to follow his footsteps. The shepherd expects the flock he has already to teach the new kids that know nothing. Kids are little goats. They represent pagans she has under her influence. So we are to be feeders of the sheep. Mm -hmm. Your job as a Christian is to feed the sheep. That's all he's ever wanted. Mm -hmm. He wants shepherds that feed the sheep. While he is gone, he is, he is the main shepherd. But see, he is going to be king of kings at some point. And the shepherds are going to get their reward. So if we don't feed the sheep, you need to be thinking of people that you can tell about Jesus. You need to have family members and neighbors and workers and people that you meet up with and you need to be feeding the sheep. And if they don't want to believe, ask them, what can I do to, to convince you? Or is there anything you'd like to know? Of course, they'll come up with a, well, who did Cain marry? You know, they'll come up with some silly question like that. Well, you need to be able to answer them or at least find out the answer. 1 Peter 5, verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. That's Peter's order to the people that he's discipling. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. How many churches compel you to join or you'll die or go to prison or whatever? And of course, during thousands of years of the Roman Catholic Church, they, they were beheaded and put in... Iron Maidens and all kinds of stuff if they wouldn't belong to the Catholic Church. All the Muslims are doing that. Well, yeah. All, all these religions say, well, you can't be around me if you're not my religion. And they don't no more believe in anything, but they have to say it or die. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. How many preachers would quit if there was no money in it? You know, if there was no money in it, how many preachers will say, I quit, i got to do something else? Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. You should always be an example even if they're not your flock because they're going to be attracted to you because you're honest mm -hmm. and kind and trustworthy. They're going to see things in you that they don't see in the world. So you're going to be attractive. You're going to be supernaturally attracting people to you so that you can witness to them. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So if you want to get a crown of glory that does not fade away, this is how you do it. Just feed the sheep. Continually feed the sheep. Don't give up feeding the sheep because that's your job. Think about when Jesus was talking to Peter asking, do you love me? And Peter said, yes. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. All of our jobs consist of feeding other sheep. Remember when I was talking about the tents? of Kedar. The Hebrew word was Ohel. O-H-E-L. But the word tents in verse 8 is Mishkan, which means tabernacle or temple. Pagans have tents, but shepherds have tabernacles. Jesus came to tabernacle among us. So if you go back to Exodus, you'll see that Moses' tent was a Mishkan. The other people's tents were Ohels. So there's a difference there. If you go back to your homework of Ezekiel 16, you can find almost verbatim quotes of God's love for Israel when he says, Ezekiel 16, 11, I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists, and chain on your neck. Okay? And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth, you ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. What was the chain around her neck? Proverbs 1.8 and 
and Solomon wrote Proverbs again. Hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Verse 9. For they will be graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So the teachings of your father and mother are going to be a chain on your neck. The Torah was considered by God to be a gold chain around their necks and a crown. So when you read about a gold chain around the neck, he's talking about his first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Verse 11, The daughters of Jerusalem, we will make your ornaments of gold with studs of silver. Uh, the Shulamite said, While the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. She refers to the king as the king, so it's not the same person. And her beloved as her beloved. She is saying her beloved is sending out perfume between her breasts and attracting others while she is still at the palace. So when you're at work, driving your garbage truck, Christ puts out a good smell. So, I'm in the front, so I don't smell that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the point is, even when she doesn't mean to, because she is turning into a Christian, she smells good to other people and is attractive to them. Uh, verse 15. The Beloved has said, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. That's twice. He's telling her. Mm -hmm. you, you have dove's eyes. Okay? This should give hope to every Christian because a dove is a clean animal and a bird of prey is unclean. The beloved didn't say she had hawk's eyes. Jesus sees his people as beautiful and clean no matter how you see yourself. God sees beauty and love. So think about that. He, as long as you are his bride, he sees beauty and love. He sees dove's eyes. He sees peace. The dove is a symbol of peace. It's a clean bird. They, if once you learn the unclean animals and the clean animals, you can decipher what the Bible is saying by which animal they choose to choose. Like in one place, a stork is carrying a big uh, lid in the air and drops it over a vessel. And a stork is a dirty animal. It has to be the right bird. Okay, verse 16. The Shulamite says, Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. The beams of our houses are cedar and our rafters are fir. Remember, her beloved is looking into her eyes as a person. But what is she looking at? She is looking at the house they will live in. She says, yes, you are my handsome, handsome all right, <clears throat> but look at the digs. What a nice bed and cedar beams in it. He wants to know her as a person and she just wants the blessings. So when you have a woman that comes up and says, man, you're a handsome man, and I really like that car you drive, it's probably not the right woman for you. The tabernacle and the temple were both filled with cedars that came from Lebanon. So that's what she is talking about here. Is she is saying, I like our bed where I can go to sleep, and I like the beams of our house or cedar. It's like saying, man, you got a pool, you got everything going for you, and I'm willing to live here. Oh, by the way, you're handsome too. <laughs> I think we call them gold diggers today. I can say the same thing. Yeah. Little shallow. Okay, she at least says the bed is ours. But in chapter 3, she again said it's my bed. Are we looking for fire insurance or do we really want to be in the presence of God? You know, a lot of people will treat God like something they keep in their pocket and they drag it out when they need it. Mm -hmm. And she is basically saying, man, I like the digs, I like what our life, I like what everything is going here, but I'm still going to live my life as I want to. <clears throat> In verse 17, she says, the house is made of cedar and a tabernacle and temple were mostly cedar. We will see the next time that she is consumed with his stuff and staying in the four walls and not working the harvest. So she is starting to follow him around and she wants to live in the house of God, but she doesn't want to do the harvest. God wants us to do the harvest. That's what we're hired to do. Right. Okay? How many of us are consumed with staying in the building and never working the harvest? 
Every time I speak of this, people will say I'm preaching works salvation. Nothing could be farther from the truth. God created, created us to work His kingdom. However, you will find over and over, I will tell you that waiting for Jesus to come back to get you in your lazy boy chair is not biblical. I think you'll find over and over in the Bible God's grace runs out at a certain time on unrepentant sin. You will have to repent for sin and do some sort of work in God's garden to earn treasure in heaven. Now why was Adam and Eve put here? To work the garden. Mm -hmm. We have the same job. And so what did Jesus do? The second Adam came to work God's garden. He was the one who started the church and got things going. Okay, So we are expected to tend to God's garden and build on it. So we need to understand that we are to work in His garden. The garden is the earth. I mean, we all like to think of the picture in Genesis of, of a spot that has a gate on it with a couple of guards, flaming swords and everything, mm -hmm. and we got to get back there. Well, the garden is the whole earth. Mm -hmm. So He cursed the earth when He kicked them out of the garden. So the garden used to be very different than it is now. He's going to bring the garden back in the last days where the the child won't be bitten by the snake and the lion and the lamb will lie down together. That's the way it was. So we're going to bring forth the new kingdom when it gets here and we'll be working the garden. And our treasures in heaven will be the fruit that we gathered from the garden. So Whenever God leads you to someone, He has probably already softened them up with the Word of God. They may say something, well, Charlie, I know you teach Sunday school. I said, what does this mean? And I give it to them. And he said, well, how can I have that? Well, let's talk. And I'll, I'll pray for you and we'll get you into the kingdom today, right now. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's bing. He does the work, but I get the increase. Or he gets the increase, but I did the work. Just because I mentioned it. Now, if I said, I don't have time for that right now, I'm working and doing something else, I missed out on the treasure God wanted to give me. Yeah. Facing God's judgment with nothing but wood, hay, and stubble to your name will be devastating for you. Now, I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about lost people. If you've been a Christian all these years and all you've got is wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be pretty embarrassing. You, will, you might still make it to heaven, but you're going to smell like smoke. And see people, well, you saying I'm going to hell? I said the thing, I went down the aisle, I paid my tithes and everything, but you've never got any fruit. But you're going to smell like smoke when you get there. I don't think a lot of people think about that. They're, you know, having fun, doing their thing, playing church, and then going doing what they want to do during the week. If we get nothing else from this lesson, it should be that going to church is not enough. Our ministry is outside. This girl is enamored with the, uh, staying in God's house inside the four walls and enjoying the blessings of God. We need to change our way of thinking to a servant instead of a diva waiting for God to serve us. I had a vision a few years ago standing before the throne as if, I was, as if it was Daniel 6.1. If you all remember, that's uh, Daniel going up before God on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So Daniel was standing on the ground down here in front of the throne and he said, woe is me. He was probably the most holy man that ever wrote anything that God ever said. But the first thing on his mind was, woe is me. A man of unclean lips. Okay. Now he was a prophet and he said, I have unclean lips. So they had, the two angels had to put a coal of fire on his mouth to, to make him holy so that he could speak to God. I had a vision of the same thing, only myself in it. God was looking down at me, and I knew He expected something from me. The parable of the talents came to my mind, and He was seeing what I had done with the investment He gave me. I could see myself reaching inside my front pants pockets, revealing a few dimes and a couple of nickels to throw down at His feet in front of the throne. Everyone could see the change rolling around on the floor. The embarrassment was crushing and terrible. I weep even today when I talk about this vision. We must see Him as the cross, on the cross ever to understand what God is looking for from His elect. 
It is not just a quaint story told in a coloring book in children's Sunday school. He gave his son for us and he expects a return on his investment. And we can't get up in front of his throne and throw a couple of nickels down mm -hmm. and say that's enough. Now, I'm not preaching work salvation. I, you know, but I believe, like he said, if you have faith, you're expected to work in the kingdom. And if you read the parables, he'll, he'll start off saying, well, what the talents and everything, I gave you five, I gave you two, and I gave you one. And the one with one buried it. Didn't do nothing with it. And it wasn't good for him. Yeah. So each parable, if you read it, it says the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. And he tells you a story after that where his servants was given a, ta a job to do and one of them didn't do it. And even a, a small amount, the one with two, made two. He, does, he knows that we're not all equal and getting, going to get the same thing everybody else gets. But he's also not a communist where you're going to get the trophy without doing nothing. You know? So we need to understand that his judgment is a reward. Now I believe that you still make it to heaven, but you're going to smell like smoke. Yeah. Everyone's going to know that you didn't do anything. trophies. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone's going to know that you didn't do anything. This is why when he says when you sit at the table, sit down. Because he'll move you up if you need to be moved up. But if you sit up here, yeah. he's going to move you down in front of everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they're going to know that you didn't do what you're supposed to do. And I got through that without crying. <laughs> you did that. <laughs> I, I, I've told the story a hundred times and almost every time I break down. Because you can't imagine what it was like to see myself in front of the throne and I was just throwing nickels down. I can cut this out. But I, I just hope that it makes an impact on you. That you'll get reinvigorated to go out and work the fields for the harvest. Because He's not looking for nothing. He's looking for something. And He will put up with so much if you will just try. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times that the Holy Spirit said, go here and do that, and I didn't do it. I did not do it. I admit it. You know, I'm trying to get better. We're all trying to get better. But I hope if the Holy Spirit says something to you, you will say, yes, sir, and go. Because you don't know what kind of reward you're in for. Because He has already set it up and said, I've got a divine appointment for you to go here and it could be the craziest thing. I want you to turn left, stop at this house, and give him five dollars. He's not going to tell you what it's for. But he will reward you if you obey. Mm -hmm. If you love me, you will do my commandments. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we're always thinking, well, what's that for? Well, why don't I just give him twenty? You know? He told you to give him five. Or whatever. You don't you don't question what he says to do. Just do it. He had given His blood for me, yet I had hardly anything for Him but a few kind words. When we make it personal, comparing what He did and has done for us with what we do for Him, it should break you. I don't believe that you can operate well if you're not broken. Because pride and other things start moving in if you're not broken. I know that is with me. Maybe I had a problem with pride before and He wants to keep me broken. But I've never wept so much in my life as after I was born again. You are no good to Him unless your heart is broken by people dying without ever knowing Jesus. You have to start thinking about the people that never heard His name. They're dying and going to hell because they never heard someone mention His name. There is much more to Christianity than singing and attending church and paying tithes. Next time, chapter 2. We'll get there. <laughs>